All right, so we'll go on to the hand and wrist. A few things about technical aspect. I really think it's essential that you use a dedicated wrist coil on any scanner. <clears throat> Still, a lot of people use other coils, and uh, it's, it's hard to really get the image quality we need to see some of the things we want to look at without having a dedicated coil. The other thing is positioning of the wrist. Uh, many people, I think, position the wrist, the wrist incorrectly, and some wrist coils require you to position the, rest, the wrist incorrectly. Uh, I think the wrist should always be placed in pronation, uh, in neutral flexion and extension and deviation, uh, and I'll explain why I think it should be in pronation uh, in this lecture. Uh, field of view, she needs to be a small field of view with typical uh, in-plane resolutions, uh, never greater than, and than 12 centimeters. Otherwise, you can't get the resolution necessary to see the structures we're looking at. And uh, used uh, true coronal axial and sagittal planes. And I used to always think that at least one sequence should be have a uh, thickness less than one millimeter, one millimeter or less. Uh, this used to actually be best done at low field because you could do gradient echo sequences and get very high 3D resolution uh, with good uh, uh, contrast. At higher fields, uh, gradient echo images don't give very good contrast because there's too much susceptibility artifact from the trabecular bone. Uh, but nowadays, I think we can get by with about 1.5 to 2 millimeter then uh, minimally skip images especially at uh, 1.5 and 3T. So this was an old coil where you had to place the patient <laughs> supine, that is, a palm up. Uh, that's, I think, really inadequate uh, scanning. And sometimes I think you even have to bring the patient back uh, if you image in the supine position. So in a supine position, you can tell the difference in imaging. Now remember that the ulna is the fixed bone in the wrist and the radius rotates around the ulna when you go from pronation to supination. Uh, so you really should describe structures in the wrist based upon the ulna, which is the stable bone, not the radius. Uh, in the supine position, notice that the ulnar styloid is placed dorsally with respect to the radius, whereas if you're in a pronated position, the uh, ulnar styloid is... Uh, is ulnar with respect to, to the radius. And what happens is if you supinate, the, if you image in supination, then you're, uh, you're, ob you're obliquely imaging across the triangular fibrocartilage, which makes it very difficult to evaluate triangular fibrocartilage disease. In the pronated position, the ulnar, the TFC, as you all know, uh, and search, search <coughs> on the fovea of the ulna and on the uh, ulnar styloid, and that becomes uh, well, ulnar-sided uh, in this position. And then you have a straight triangular fiber cartilage that attaches to the radius, and you have much better imaging of the triangular fiber cartilage. So uh, I really believe that imaging should be done in the pronated position. Uh, in the past, we used to use a lot of arthrography. Uh, I've seen a lot of arthrograms of other joints lately, and I've seen a couple of the wrist. But uh, with current imaging, I, I, I don't think wrist arthrography really has a, uh, a usage in, in a lot of routine practice, maybe occasionally for specialty questions. Uh, but uh, the image quality we have in today's imaging, I think, uh, uh, means that we no longer really need arthrography. Uh, and with arthrography, you've got to worry about overdistension, where you can kind of blow out, uh, and in this case, uh, uh, extension of contrast into the prestyloid recess. With overdistension, you also can uh, force contrast uh, into the middle uh, carpal uh, compartment here, <coughs> even though you do not have a scaphalunate ligament tear. So overdistension distension can be a cause of false positives. Uh, in uh, wrist imaging. You can also communicate by over distension by forcing the contrast through the pisiform triquetral 
joint space and into the middle carpal joint space. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about bones now. Uh, uh, Robert, what do you think of this case? Uh, here, looking at the uh, lunate and triquetrum, look like they're fused. So. Yeah. So, so here, this uh, you have a very elongated. Uh, uh, well, I mean, you have fusion between the scaphoid and the lunate, and a very elongated triquetrum in this particular case, with a single joint involving the proximal carpal roll. Uh, so this is congenital fusions. The congenital fusions are not rare in, in the wrist, uh, and especially in kids, you can see them. Uh, Elia, or, Elia, or what do you think of this case? So here's yeah similar bone fusion between the lunate and the triquetrum. Yeah, so an, another fusion. And uh, obviously this increases the stress on the fused bone and the, uh, in this case, the uh, scaphoid, increasing the risk of scaphoid dissociation and tearing, which was present in this case. Okay, and then here's a low field point two Tesla scanner, gradient echo sequence over here, and we can see that there's a fusion with a scaphoid diastasis and tearing the scaphoid ligament. All right. Uh, looks like we have some uh, increased signal on that TFCC, and maybe the lunate is a little more proximally uh, positioned. Okay, so here. does this the kind of a pointed lunate, does that ring any bells? Uh, not sure. So this is a, a metalline deformity. Okay. This is a, kind of a subtle case where you get a pointed arrow-like uh, lunate pointing uh, proximally here. It also puts stress on the triangular fibro cartilage, so it's often associated with TFC injuries. Uh, <clears throat> So we see some kind of deformity of the distal radius. Okay, so we have a deformity of the distal radius here, kind of a pointed lunate here. Probably a little negative ulnar variance, but it's a little hard to see. So mm -hmm. here, a little flexor deformity. We go to the CT scan, this is what it looks like. Okay. We go to the 3D, it looks like this. Okay. Um, is it the same with the pointed lunate? Right. This is a, just a more prominent uh, metalline deformity. Actually, just one second. Let me see if I can pause this for a minute. I hope I didn't screw everything up. Let me just see. Yes. Yeah, I'm in a lec I'm in a lec I'm giving a lecture right now. What, what can I do for you? I have a question with the hand here that or something. They had a scan in 2019, so I have no documentation as to what it is. Well, can we do another one? And they've they've had they've had no surgery since the previous brain scan. No, we put it in 2002. Oh, okay. Well, if they've already. They've had several brains since then. Okay, I think it's okay if they've had a prior study. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.
I guess that. Okay. <clears throat> I guess it didn't stop it like I asked it to. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> so this is just a, a more prominent meddling deformity. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Robert. All right. Uh, wrist pain after mild trauma. Uh, I don't, I don't see a fracture. There's a little bit of a negative owner variance on the uh, sagittal. The lunate looks like. Just one second here. I need to. Guess I saw the answer there. You saw the answer. <laughs> sure did. Okay, uh, okay. <clears throat> so here we can see the bipartite lunate with uh, sclerotic margins on either side uh, and through here. So this is another rare congenital variant. And do we know the age of that patient? I do not. It's an, ad it's an adult, but I don't know the, the age. Okay, uh, Elior. Okay, 32-year-old male with ulnar-sided pain and swelling. Um, I see edema in the, let's see, is it the triquetrum? Okay. Yeah. And then you can and... see here's an articulation with a piece of form. And we've got kind of a hypertrophic bone formation right in through here. There you can see it in the coronal images with also some edema <clears throat> in the hamate. Mm -hmm. Here are the sagittal images. Yeah, uh, a fusion with, I think, synovial thickening is what we're seeing. Okay. And erosive change in the bone. Yeah, that's a very funny thing. The, the bone is too large, very irregular and kind of speculated margins. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like on the CT scan. I see. Here are the sagittal reconstructions on CT. Hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, could it be an exostosis? Well, it looks like multiple bones in this area are involved. It really looks like it's some sort of a Epiphyseal dysplasia, right? Okay. This is, this is called Trevor's disease, and it tends to only be one sided congenital. Okay. All right, right wrist pain for five months. We have a very diminutive looking scaphoid on this side. Yeah, so very diminutive scaphoid. <clears throat> yeah, the scaphalunate intervals uh, yeah. definitely wide. And if you notice, there, <clears throat> there's asymmetry between the thumb on both sides. Yeah, very uh, small CMC yeah, so, joint on that side. So on the right side, we're having things on the radial side of the upper arm that look a little bit odd. I think this is a little hard to see. Let's go. Uh, and then here are the uh, shoulders on both sides. Um, notice. Kind of have a prominent scapula there. Is that yeah, scapula? Elevated scapula. And then. And then here we can see that there's some deformities and some congenital fusions in the cervical spine. Uh, and uh, this is a syndrome called radial dysplasia. It's rare, it's uh, congenital, and involves the radial aspect of the forearm, wrist, and hand. Uh, and it can lead to abnormal function of the hand. This is a more severe example of radial dysplasia. Okay. 
All right, and uh, sagittal and axial view of the wrist. Um, so it looks like the lunate is uh, bouldery. Well, the bouldery. dorsal uh, angulation to the lunate, we'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, uh, what do you think of this? Looks like there's a accessory bone there. Right, and that bone is called an osteoideum. More frequently what we'll see is it'll be connected to the capitate here and you'll get a prominent dorsal aspect of the capitate. But when it's congenitally a separate bone, it's called an osteoideum. It can be a, a cause of a, of a feeling of a hard bony mass on the dorsal aspect of the wrist, uh, which we'll see more examples of later. Not an infrequent reason for getting an MR scan. And then here's just, we see a big deformity here. And we can follow that it up actually in between the rider bones. And this is a, a trapezial anomaly. I don't know, it probably has a name. I haven't actually been able to find it, but it's, uh, it's still a rare, but not real. I mean, it's an uncommon, but not rare deformity of uh, carpal bones, an abnormal trapezium. Okay, uh, Robert. All right, so we have a 25-year-old female finger hypertrophy and epilepsy. Uh, looking at that second proximal phalanx, it looks thickened and uh, there's some periosteal reaction. Yeah, it looks... Yeah, a lot of periosteal reaction there. So when you get swelling like this and inflammatory changes in one digit, what's the first disease that we usually think about? Uh, maybe like psoriatic arthritis. but right, Psoriatic arthritis, uh, and which we'll see examples of in later lectures as well. Uh, but th this patient has this, uh, an epilepsy, which typically isn't associated with psoriatic arthritis, and didn't have any evidence of psoriasis. And this also looks like marked periosteal reaction, which is not usually what we see in psoriatic arthritis. We usually just see a lot of tenosynovitis and soft tissue edema without this severe hyperostatic bone reaction. Uh, they call it sausage finger? Yeah, and they call it a sausage finger, sp specifically talking mostly about psoriatic disease. Now, this patient had a CT scan, though, and what do you, I mean, an MR scan of the brain. What did you think of the brain? Uh, just looking at the ventricles, there's a couple of little projections there. Right. Yeah. So a little, little tiny tuber projections oh, yeah. there, and uh, this is tuberous sclerosis. Okay, Elior. Uh, okay. This, is, this is a four-year-old female, and I, so you probably don't have your hand atlas with you. The, the bone age is uh, more than a year early, younger. So uh, delayed development of the bones. Notice we're not having any ossification of the patella yet at age four years old. And then there's some funny things here called horns on the iliac, iliac horns. Mm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Right. yeah, and then you can see that there is some delayed development later, and this is uh, nail patellar syndrome, has a bunch of other different names. It's an autosom autosomal dominant phenomenon, so just things to no, think it, about. To, it, to iliac at. horns? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mass for 1.5 years. Uh, it looks like kind of prominent muscle there in the uh, extensor compartment. Right, uh, in the fourth extensor compartment. Good. And then here you can see this mass extending along here. 
have a name for it. <laughs> sure. So that that's uh, called the extensor digitorum brevis manus. And remember that uh, we've talked about a number of different areas where uh, muscles can extend into retinacular confined spaces and they can produce symptoms. Palpable mass, they can get ischemia of the muscle and it can be painful and so forth. Uh, this is one of many variations in muscles that you can see uh, around the hand. It's one of the more common ones around the hand, extensor digitorum brevis manus. And here's where it's located. And you can see this muscle signal intensity extending longitudinally along the course of the extensor tendon. And they can be symptomatic because it's a confined space that's not built for a, a muscle. Okay. 21 year old female, mass for one year, MRI red is negative, um, kind of similar to the last case. Right. Um, but maybe. So, so this was a local case, which was red as normal study. And you can see that the marker is placed right over the mass. And this was an extensor digitorum brevis manus that wasn't recognized mm -hmm. um, reading the MR scan. Okay, uh, Robert. All right, so we have a 43 year old female uh, looking at the image on the left. There's some, uh, I guess, Erosive changes of the distal phalanges, kind of first through third, and then on the right-sided image, there's a whole lot of right. abnormality. <laughs> so it's probably going. To, it looks like it's going to be a syndrome. I guess one thing you could think about would be if the patient had a burn injury, yeah. or uh, uh, could potentially do something like this. Uh, and there are some infectious diseases that might you might want to include in the differential. What would you think of it as an infectious disease that you might consider? Uh, not entirely sure, to be honest. Uh, there's a colony on one of the islands in Hawaii. Oh, leprosy. Yeah. Yeah, you could think about the potential leprosy, uh, but this is the Rusi Le Levy syndrome, and it's an, an inherited uh, uh, congenital deformity. Okay, well, let's go on and talk a little bit about trauma. So, how many of you guys have heard of Lou Galula? I have not. Yes, amazing. Well, when I was uh, when I was at your edge of training, he was one of the more famous musculoskeletal radiologists in the U.S. Uh, from St. Louis, Lou Galula, and he defined three arches to evaluate on plane radiographs of the wrist. Uh, one here really goes along the base of the capitate and proximal hamate, one that goes along the distal aspect of the scaphoid lunate and triquetrum, and one along the proximal scaphoid lunate and triquetrum. And these should also be nice, smooth lines. If you see an acute jog, then you have to be concerned, especially in trauma, that you may have a ligament rupture uh, producing uh, focal uh, instability. Uh, uh, or or a fracture, so you'd have to be careful. So uh, you, you always, in plain films, like to look at Galula's arches. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that uh, he, he liked to talk about was that the two common uh, f f fracture injuries or injuries of the, of the wrist that are significant include fractures that go along the uh, mid-carpal row, predominantly the waist fracture of the scaphoid, which you've, I'm sure, seen a lot of and we'll see more of later. But you can also get fractures involving the hamate and, and capitate and triquetrum. Uh, or injuries to the ligamentous structures around the lunate, which we'll talk about the different lunate dislocation syndromes uh, probably later in this talk, where you get tears of one or more of the ligaments uh, that stabilize the lunate. You got fractures too, and fract yeah, and that can they can be associated with fractures too. So these are called greater arch injuries, and these are called lesser arch injuries. 
Uh, and it's a little bit less helpful in MR, though it's just nice to remember that these are classic locations of injury. Uh, and some of them will be associated with specific mechanisms that we'll talk about. But in plain films, that can be very helpful in seeing subtle injuries in plain films. Okay, who is next? Um, Danny. I think I am. Oh, okay. Uh, is that Elior? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so, acute trauma. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Scaphalunate interval looks irregular, but I don't see a fracture or displacement. Does the scaphalunate something doesn't look right? Yeah. Oh, I think they can't hear us. 